Hello, Royal History Geeks. It's Gareth here. So, a couple of days ago, I had the awesome, wonderful uh, privilege of sitting down, so to speak, over Zoom, um, with Dr. Owen Emerson, who is the uh, castle supervisor and resident historian at Hever Castle in Kent. Now, you, of course, will know that Hever was the uh, childhood home of Anne Boleyn. It's also been home to some other amazing figures throughout history. So I spoke to him all about Hever, which is one of my favourite places to go, by the way, and it should be one of yours too. Um, I spoke about the role Hever's played in history and discovered loads about how it's been involved in some epic parts of our history that I didn't know about. Um, and I also spoke about what's going on Hever and the good things that are there to go and see, and a little bit about portraiture and that um, enigmatic question of what Anne Boleyn might have looked like. So check it out, tune in, let me know what you think in the comments, and I'll see you soon. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, or good very early morning, as I know some of you tend to watch in the early hours. Um, welcome to the next uh, Royal History Geeks uh, discussion. Is it a podcast? Let's, let's call it a podcast. Welcome to the next um, Royal History Geeks podcast. And we have the absolute privilege to be joined today by Dr. Owen Emerson, who is the resident historian and castle supervisor at the legendary Hever Castle. Welcome, Owen. How are you today? I'm very good, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. It's an absolute pleasure. Well, it's a pleasure for us. So, Owen, I have just introduced you in my own words, but just describe um, to the world, in your own words, who you are and what your role at Hever is. Sure. So uh, I'm a social and cultural historian and uh, I have the absolute pleasure of uh, looking after uh, the sort of the day to day running of Heber Castle. I'm the castle supervisor there. Um, it's been a, a dream uh, of mine to work at Heber and uh, I'm pleased to say I'm currently living that dream. So where, you say that's been your, your dream. How did your interest in history and perhaps particularly the, the, the eras that Heber is so closely associated with begin? Sure. So um, I think more broadly, um, I uh, live uh, in a, an area that's steeped in family history. Um, so I live in a, a house that um, multiple generations of my family lived in. And uh, I had the benefit of having young parents and therefore um, a lot of great, great aunts who lived nearby. And uh, they were all uh, in service at uh, our local big house, which is Sheffield Park. Um, so I sort of grew up um, with those familial stories, um, which really sort of um, got me into the, the social side of history. Um, but I can actually date um, the very beginning of my love of history very accurately indeed. Uh, it was on the 24th of September 1988 when I was wow. <laughs> at the ripe old age of four. And um, uh, it was actually one of those great aunt's birthday parties that my mum snuck me out and um, because Anne of the Thousand Days was on television and she wanted uh, to show it to me because it was a, a firm favourite of hers as a child oh, wow. and I was just absolutely enraptured by it and uh, had to go to Hever because of course it's featured there yes, yes. and uh, yeah that really was the sort of day one of my uh, love of history and it hasn't abated yet. So you really yeah. are living the film star dream then in terms of <laughs> yes. living and working in an environment that you remember from, from the screen. Very much so. And uh, I, I remember going there quite a lot as a child and just being enraptured by it. It's a, such a evocative place. And I remember quite early on sort of dreaming of being able to, to work in a place like that. Um, so, yeah, my, my interest of history was sort of split between... Um, these incredible stories of uh, extraordinary famous people, uh, particularly women. I've always had a uh, real focus on women. And then, of course, uh, the lives of ordinary people, whatever that really means. Um, and um, yes, I've, I've always sort of straddled that, uh, that divide. Well, that, that's an interesting, um, a really interesting area, actually, because obviously my 
my blog is called Royal History Geeks and the, the focus is unambiguously on, if you like, I mean, let's not be around, but the powerful, I, you know, I, it, it, I'm interested in, in where the, the power structures of, of the day um, ebbed and flowed from. But personally, I've also done a lot of, again, my family history and looked at the sort of social history um, uh, uh, around that. And it is fascinating uh, as well. And, and do you feel that having a greater understanding of social history and of the lives of real people actually enhances your general understanding of the whole era and the stories that we're so familiar with? Yeah, I really do. Because, um, you know, the story of um, how ordinary people have gained power uh, has always been at the expense of the loss of those who once held it um, so all of those concerns all of those issues um, are, are inherently wrapped up with the the lives of ordinary people mm. um, and I, I also think um, if we you know apply some of the techniques that we use to look at the lives of ordinary people um, we can sort of better understand uh, those um, very uh, grand uh, people's experiences as well um, that is not to say that people's experiences haven't shifted over time. And, uh, and I, my particular focus is uh, on the history of emotions and they, they of course, shift over time as well. Um, uh, but yeah, and no, I do very much feel that um, uh, looking at the, the everyday really helps us to, to understand mm. um, the lives of uh, more, more powerful people, definitely. Mm. I mean, it's, it's always fascinating in that we think of power shifts of being, we won't go down this tangent for too long because it probably interests you, me and about two other people out there, but um, how we think of that as quite a recent phenomena and, you know, the advent of, of democracy and, and, and all, of, all of those different things. But of course, what I find interesting is if you take, if you take almost any era of literature or fictional portrayals, whether it's Jane Austen, whether it's something like Downton Abbey, which of course they're sort of 200 years apart in terms of where they're set, the underpinning sort of theme of one powerful class declining and another one coming up to take their place is actually quite prevalent in both. And of course you see that in the Tudor era, you to a lesser extent see that in parts of the medieval era and you sort of think that, well, that, that ebbing and flowing has always been there in one way or another. It really has and it's, it's always been a negotiation because um, you know, powerful people have always uh, uh, lived at the mercy of those uh, whom they tax and whom uh, um, they owe, um, you know, their survival to in, in terms of defending their realm and so forth. Um, so there's always been this negotiation. There's always been this um, uh, gradual transfer and uh, push and pull between uh, those with power and, and uh, those seemingly without. Um, and in many ways, Hever Castle is a manifestation of that uh, anxiety. Um, it only exists uh, because of the threat uh, that the local populace um, uh, poses to powerful people. Um, yeah. Well, how, tell us a bit about your own personal journey, Tiva. We've heard about where the, the love affair, if you like, began. When, how did you, what was your path to actually working in the castle? Sure. Um, so I was finishing off my uh, doctoral research and I was incredibly lucky to secure funding for that. Um, but that only has a limited uh, time and uh, my, my topic was particularly large and I needed uh, to find uh, some uh, employment essentially when um, that funding ran out. Mm. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I thought of no better place uh, to start working uh, than at Heaver so I, I wrote to them and said do you have any jobs going and uh, the job they came back with was working in the operations department so uh, ticketing and car parking and picking litter um, which was just the kind of job I needed because I didn't need anything that I needed um, that I had to take home mm -hmm. uh, that I could uh, just drop and uh, get on with my studies um, so I had a, a blissful period of about three months working in um, uh, that department and then an opportunity arose in the castle um, so I started stewarding in the castle and uh, uh, about five months into my um, working there um, uh, an opposition uh, position sorry came up um, to, to supervise the incredible team of stewards so uh, I was lucky enough to secure that as well. Oh wonderful and it's yes. going well very much so. It's an absolute dream job. Um, it poses its challenges, but um, I, I couldn't be happier, really. 
tell us a bit about your doctoral research. Am I right in thinking it was, it's around, uh, was it corporal punishment? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so um, the shape of my PhD was really um, sort of dictated in one way and then um, uh, shaped by the, the people at the university that I was at as well. Um, um, one of the sort of uh, complications of the restructuring of universities with the introduction of fees uh, was that um, the university I was at, which was Sussex, um, its early modern department closed, uh, right, which yeah. for an early modernist was uh, a bit of a shock. Cool. And if I'm honest, I was on, on the uh, verge of going to un another university. Um, but I had two incredible um, individuals, uh, two incredible women, Professor Claire Langhammer and Professor Lucy Robinson, who um, took me under their wing and... Um, uh, really gave me a window into that other passion of mine, social history. So um, I'd always been fascinated by uh, an event in the 1660s, um, which was a, a children's petition, um, which was largely uh, organised by children and submitted to Parliament um, regarding the control of corporal punishment, because, of course, in the early modern period, corporal punishment was rather prolific, particularly for children. Um, and I really wanted, therefore, to see where that story ended, where children's involvement in the liberation, if you want to put it like that, from corporal punishment uh, uh, ended up. Um, so, yes, I um, decided to look at the abolition of corporal punishment, how it came about, and what children's role was in mm. that movement um so yeah that's broadly uh, what i looked at very much inspired um by claire langhammer's work professor claire langhammer uh, when she looked at the abolition of capital punishment mm. um and she did so again uh, by looking at what role emotion um played in that mm. how much feelings were attached to um that movement and uh and what difficulties uh, emotion and uh, it's impo um, implied opposite reason posed uh, to that debate. And so, I mean, it sounds absolutely fascinating. Is it going to, is it published? Is it something people can read? Yeah, I'm really hoping to publish it in the next couple of years. I've got a, right. an embargo on it at the moment. And, sure. uh, yeah, I'm uh, very much hoping when my current book is published that I'll be able to dedicate some time to getting the Brilliant. thesis published too. And tell us about that current book that you're working on. Uh, it's a heavenly project. I'm working with the amazing Claire Ridgway and uh, we're looking at the social history of Hever Castle. So mm -hmm. um, it's going to be entitled Hever, a castle and its people. And uh, wow. it's really looking uh, at the castle from the inside out. So we'll cover how the castle itself was shaped, uh, but doing so explicitly through the people and uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the situation they were, they were living in uh, and looking at the castle and the alterations over time as a manifestation of the, the context that those people were living in. That's, that sounds absolutely fascinating. Well, so whenever that's published, we'll certainly um, do some stuff about it on the blog. That sounds brilliant. Fantastic. I mean, picking up on some of those themes, the Hiva we have today, I mean, obviously, for most royal history geeks, we associate Hiva with Anne Boleyn. Of course, the history is, is broader, deeper, wider than, than Anne Boleyn. But the Hiva we go to today, I mean, I'm at Hiva all, all the time. I only live down the road. It's one of my favourite places to be, although I'm not a member, which is strange, isn't it? I, I should probably bite the bullet on that one. You but um, well, I think I will. Um, but how much of the Hiva we enjoy today is the Hiva that Anne Boleyn would have recognised? Um, so... Actually, I'd argue overwhelmingly so. Um, there has been over the years a lot of um, questions about how much of the, the house itself uh, is the Boleyn's house. Um, but I don't know if you saw um, Professor Simon Thurley's recent lecture. He uh, very much uh, agrees with me that uh, the, the, the castle and the house that you experience today would overwhelmingly be familiar to uh, the Boleyn's. And I think that's a testament to the fact that post Berlin occupancy and post Anne of Cleves, who I'm sure we'll talk about at some point, um, the owners of Hever primarily rented it out. Um, and we have some really big names, the, the Wardgraves, the Mead Wardos, but they don't live at Hever. 
um, they um, purposefully purchase it in order to, to let it out for further income, which was a, a common thing to do. Um, and of course, tenants are far less likely to make permanent alterations to a property if they don't own it. Um, so much of the survival of the house is, is um, uh, because it wasn't um, lived in by its yes. owners. Um, so in terms of the castle exterior, it will be overwhelmingly familiar to the Berlins should they yes. uh, come back and uh, have a look. It's barely changed apart from the addition of later windows, which are themselves uh, a testament to the, the shifting context in which Heaver is um, uh, living. Mm. Um, so it's shifted from a place uh, of being uh, a defensive home, which Heaver always was, mm. into something uh, a bit calmer. Uh, according um, to the, the relative peace yeah. that people are living through. Um, but I would say aesthetically in terms of the interior, sort of beneath the, those uh, Tudor style panellings, which are our later yeah. edition, those beams, those, uh, you know, purlins and uh, joists, they're, they're the very same ones that carried that very heavy weight of history. Yeah. Uh, so you really are uh, walking in the footsteps of, of the Berlins when you visit. It's quite an extraordinary survival. I, I always think it's fascinating um, whenever I go, as I often do, to Heber with new people that have not been there before. Um, and most people, how, you know, even if they're not that into history, will go in, come out of the castle and go, that was incredible. I've just, I've just gone back in time. I really feel it. There's a small cohort of people who don't get invited back for a second visit, um, who say something along the lines of, oh, it's quite small. And I think people hear castle and they think of something incredibly large and grand, but of course that's all later. The sort of Tudor Manor House and earlier aren't huge as we would understand them to be. The kind of 17th, 18th century big mansions are, are a late development. Is that is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, these, these really are... Um, uh, you know, a reflection of the the, the context in which people mm. are living. Um, so it's really only the Tudor era in which um, privacy is a, is a desirable or possible uh, thing. And um, people lived much more collectively and communally before that. Um, so they are, it is a relatively modest manner. Uh, it's certainly not the grandest house that the Berlin's own. Mm. Um, but I would argue it's the HQ. Mm. Um, it's compact it's private and that really comes into its own um when obviously things hot up at court yes but prior to that it's um the, the perfect base for thomas it sits smack bang in between the route to greenwich to court yeah. where he um is heavily employed and the coast to dover is right in the middle is mm. the center of thomas's world and of course he's a diplomat and goes abroad um, so it's the perfect place to leave your children and your wife elizabeth uh, who has a lifetime stake in heaver in and of herself it's left uh, to her in william billings dower um, so it's really the, the the heart of their world and i as i we're arguing in our book it's their their headquarters and would it have been the heart of Anne's world in her girlhood? Obviously, she ends up on the continent. At, and, well, we're not quite sure what age she, she departs the continent. But, but before then, and perhaps after then, would it have been the heart of Anne's world? Very much so. And uh, particularly um, uh, when Henry starts to um, begin to be interested in her. Uh, it's the place that she returns to again and again. Um, usually when she needs to reconcile and uh, but also in terms of peril in times of peril um for example in 1528 when the, the sweating sickness hits it's the heaver that they immediately uh, descend um so it's a place where the family can withdraw where they're secure where it's private and they can regroup and uh, deal with the situations that are rapidly shifting over time so when we're going, when we are going and we're there, we are definitely enjoying a place that Anne would have called home for a big significant part of her life. Absolutely. It's, it's no, um, you know, it's, it's not by any other uh, reason that um, 
and returns there it's her safe haven that's mm. that's how i like to think mm. of it and all of those letters or many of them that are now sitting in the vatican archives uh, written by henry to Anne, mm. were sent to Heva. um so um and, and we do have evidence also that when thomas is abroad Anne would return there on her own she would live there as right, her, right. as it's as her own household yeah when so in terms of the history of Eva before you get to roughly when Anne Boleyn was born. When, when do we think, or, or do we know definitively when Eva was built? We don't. Um, uh, and this, this uh, conundrum is complicated uh, by a fact that not many people are aware of. There are two manors at Eva, and there still are. Um, so there is Eva Cobham, which is now called Eva Castle. Mm-hmm. And, <coughs> do, do apologise, uh, so there's Hever Cobham, now Hever Castle, and there's Hever Brockus, which is literally about a mile away. Uh, and these two manors um, were often co-owned by the owners, and therefore references to Hever uh, are more than ambiguous because uh, it could be one of two properties okay. over time. What we do know is that William de Hever, um, who is the Sheriff of Kent, Uh, in the 1270s and who we believe was descended from a Norman baron Uh, he had a manor where Hever Cobham now is and um, we then know that uh, a family um, called the Cobhams hence Hever Cobham Mm -hmm. um, uh, were in possession of the castle in the 1380s Um, uh, in particular John the Cobham of Devonshire who was a, a tax collector in nearby Sussex Right. And he was granted a license to crenellate that manor in 1383, just two years after the peasants' revolt. Right. Now, of course, uh, Simon Sudbury, the ultimate tax collector, had been dragged from the Tower of London by the peasants mm. and beheaded. Um, so you can kind of understand why uh, John the Cobham of Devonshire, tax collector, would want uh, a nice, quiet little castle in a valley. Uh, in the next county, uh, and, mm. and a heavily fortified one too. Uh, it sort of makes sense uh, that he would want to live yes. with that level of security. Um, it was then briefly owned by a, a family called the Scropes, and then um, oh. by Sir John Fastolf. Um, is is who... that the same Scropes as in... Um... Is Richard II had a close yes. ally, didn't he? He was a scrope. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah, they only have a very short tenure, but you're absolutely right. Um, they, they do have links to Richard. Um, uh, yes, um, Sir John Fastolf um, was a, a soldier in the Hundred Years' War. And he, of course, is immortalised as a very unflattering character in a lot of Shakespeare's plays, uh, Fast, mm. uh, Falstaff, um, uh, particularly in Henry IV and uh, also in The Merry Wives of Windsor. Um, Our first beheading um, uh, comes with the Fines family, uh, most notably uh, Sir James Fines. Um, Now he loses his head in another uprising. Kent is a hotbed for rebellions, Mm -hmm. uh, led by uh, Jack Cade in the 1450s. Um, And famously his head was um, displayed uh, with um, some of Henry VI's six other favourites who were also beheaded, kissing right. each other. It was rather a dramatic um, Ooh, yeah. and rather grim scene, I should imagine. Mm. Um, and it's then that Sir Geoffrey Boleyn, who is the pivotal Boleyn, uh, yeah. he um, is Anne Boleyn's great-grandfather, and he rises through, firstly, the hatting industry, then through the Mercers, and right. eventually makes um, uh, Lord Mayor of London. And he actually purchases Hever as part of a syndicate with his brother and some other right. associates uh, in 1462. So that's how it uh, uh, sort of travels into, into the Berlin hands. Well, that's fascinating because I, I didn't know any of that. And you can say, I mean, may, maybe this is the too bold a claim, but through what you've just outlined, you can see some associations between Hever and the Lancastrian Revolution of 1399. And the Wars of the Roses in terms of the Cage um, Rebellion. That was, that was arguably the beginning of, of the Wars of the Roses. And Hever actually has a link and an association with, with those great events, as well as everything that would come later. Absolutely. I mean, people are uh, 
sort of universally obsessed by the Berlins and I don't blame them uh, but there is a much much richer history um, either side of, of the Berlin mm. so it's it's really actually fascinating um, to delve into that that wider history mm. and and to see how it links to that um, uh, Berlin tenure you know there are, there are multiple connections that lead to the context in which the Berlins um, can mm. rise to power um, so it's a, a very interconnected and, and a very rich uh, beginning for, for Hever Castle. Mm. Mm. One, one of the things people always ask me when, when I'm with them and they've done the, um, done the audio tour, um, people always say, when did the name go from Bullen to Berlin? And I say, well, st- spellings weren't standardised. And actually, sometimes you see Anne, it's spelled Bullen for, for Anne too. But is there any story around that? Uh, there is certainly sort of anachronistic ones, um, which... Uh, suggests that they sort of Frenchified their name. I did wonder. Um, that. I did yeah, wonder. Yeah. That. Um, but um, I, I think you've you've answered the question. Really, it's it's really a question of no standardised spelling. I think the I think the truth of the matter is, uh, if you look at the Berlin's heraldry, uh, the three bulls' heads. That yes. Um, uh, that was a, a pun on their surname. Uh, so there probably would have been more of an in- emphasis on the bull. Uh, yes, element of the, yes. the the surname to make that pun more explicit yes. but of course our, our language uh, the spoken language has shifted considerably since uh, you know uh, the Tudor era yeah. uh, you can see that when we you read uh, in the original pronunciation of, of Shakespeare's works um, so yeah I think it's really a, I mean we've got four portraits of Anne at Hever not one of them is spelt the same in mm, fact I found yeah. well over or nearly 30 variations on the spelling uh, of Berlin uh, and you know uh, individuals will quite often spell Berlin differently in the same document so there was a much mm. more fluidity in, in the early modern period yes. than we just used to now. And if they did if, it, if they did decide that they wanted to Frenchify a bit would that purely be you know most of the great families had a Norman sort of ish connected name descent you know came over with the conqueror and that was something to aspire to be seen as? Yeah, very much so, I think. And, you know, the Berlins are sort of irrevocably linked to France. Mm. Um, And of course, Anne comes back from France uh, and uh, individuals say that she, you could mistake her for a French woman born. Uh, There's no, it's not a coincidence that, um, you know, they they have their education there. Um, But, uh, you know, does Berlin sound more French. Um, I mean, when Anne's 14, she writes a a letter to her father, uh, probably to Hever, actually. Um, And she signs Anne du Boulin, uh, which I would argue sounds (laughs) quite a lot more French than (laughs) Um, So, yeah. Uh, Yeah, I think uh, think there's just far, far more fluidity um, than we're used to. Um, So we we like to to, um, make sense of that by... um, showing a, a journey that's explainable by the context. Mm. Um, but, you know, Catherine Howard, she also spelt her name differently mm. Uh, mm. In, in different times. So yes. um, it, it's just more about getting a headset, uh, head yeah. uh, mindset around, uh, around, that, around that fluidity. Which actually, if you have studied your own family history, is easier to do because even 100 years ago, there wasn't really any standardised spelling. No, not at all. And, and also... Um, my surname has two M's in it, but there were mm. individuals who really objected to it. So they dropped the one of the M's. Mm. Um, so, for example, my great grandfather married uh, a woman called Dorothy and she just thought it was irritating. There were two M's. So she just <laughs> left the other one out, which I love. You know, they're, they're, they're married to each other. She's taken this name, but she's adjusted it. I like name. that. I'm taking your name, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just going to modify it a little. Speaking of families, tell us a bit more about the Astors, because by all accounts, those of us that love Heva have a lot of reason to be grateful for the Astors. Is that is that fair? Yeah, definitely so. Um, uh, there's there's sort of a myth that Heva was completely in ruins or right. on the verge of ruin uh, when Astor purchases it. Um, but I would argue that the, the saviour of Heva if you want to find one, was probably uh, the tenant before that, and a right. gentleman called Captain Guy Seabright, okay. uh, who rented it in the uh, 1890s. 
Um, but what the Astors do is uh, and, uh, and are able to afford, which Seabright mm. couldn't, was a, a vast accumulation of wealth. Right. Um, they spend, in today's money, almost a, a billion dollars on the Heaver estate. It's quite an uh, unimaginable figure. Um, but why I, I think we're so indebted to them is they didn't tear the whole thing down internally, the, the house, and create a, a much more comfortable Edwardian dwelling. They really did stick to the footprint of the Blinns house. Right. That's why the Blinns would recognise it if they walked in. They wouldn't recognise the panelling, uh, but they would recognise the layout because mm. he did not change much at all. Um, what they wouldn't recognise is the landscape um, mm. because he has absolutely changed that almost beyond recognition. Right. Um, Heaver chiefly would have been a hunting ground. It was mm -hmm. the Kentish Weald. It would have been very right. thick woodland. Uh, and of course, that played a ma major part in the local industry. Um, for, uh, for the iron industry, the, the wood being able to, to power the furnaces. Um, and we know that it's a rich hunting ground, for example, Anne of Cleves again. Uh, mm. she, we got a letter that she sends from Heaver where she thanks her brother for um, some hunting birds that he mm. sends her there. Um, so, yeah, he was able to completely re-landscape that. He, for example, uh, had a lake hand dug over two years by 800 mm. men. And, and I'm sure you'll agree, wow. it's absolutely stunning mm, um, mm, mm. Uh, landscape now, but not one that the Billings would have recognised. That's, right. that's the one thing that he really altered. Well, I have to say, not, and I would not describe myself as any kind of horticultural or, ag ag or architectural or agricultural expert at all. But when I'm in the grounds, of, particularly the further you get from the actual castle, the more I feel like I am in some of the other sort of national trust properties I may have visited and that sort of style um, is, is more familiar, but still yeah. wonderful. Um, and still, and, and, and frankly, probably a little bit more suited to a good day out than, um, yes. than, than what, what Anne <laughs> yes. might, might have known. One, one of my favorite things about um, Hever is the artwork and the portraiture that's on display. And I, I'm not a natural uh, art history by any means, and I don't claim to understand uh, all the things that I find interesting. Uh, but of course, what you do have at Hever, and it's one of the first things you see as you start going to the castle, is the portrait um, that has now been verified as Mary Boleyn. Um, right. how, how exciting was that when that was confirmed by whoever confirmed it? <laughs> Yeah, it, it was incredibly exciting because I think one of the, the casualties of being um, a sister to a queen is, uh, and particularly one that reigns for just over a thousand days, um, is that you're in the shadows. I think the same could be said for George Boleyn, uh, who, of course, we have um, no confirmed imagery of either. Uh, um, and... Um, it was incredibly exciting because uh, the late Eric Ives always said that, you know, what we know about Mary Billing could fit on a postcard with room for the address. Um, mm -hmm. So at least we now have a face. Um, yes. I mean, we've always historically believed that was uh, Mary mm. Billing. It's had a long history of being identified as her. Um, but what the, um, I think they called the, the Van Dyke panel project. Yes. Yes. Um, and, um, they were looking at a series of 13 beauties. I think they thought they were 12 um, that were originally in um, Queen Anne's bathroom at Windsor. Mm -hmm. Really magnificent collection. Um, but one of them really didn't sort of fit the mould, mm -hmm. Mary Boleyn, uh, because she was in a much earlier dress. Mm -hmm. And um, I, uh, I believe that what... Um, they were able to demonstrate essentially was that um, there was a connection to one of uh, Mary's ancestors uh, and those uh, two mm, portraits yes. were essentially painted on the same yes. tree on the, uh, from the same panelling when mm -hmm. they dendrochronologised it, um, which is incredibly uh, exciting. Mm. And it, they were also able to then compare that portrait pattern um, to other examples uh, that had verifiable inscriptions contemporary uh, yes, descriptions yes. so uh, although ours is an 18th century copy mm. uh, it's actually very close uh, and, and, and a very good copy mm. um, so 
yeah, it's incredibly exciting to, to have it and, mm. and to know that it's in situ in Mary's house. It's lovely. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, Mary is someone that, and this is common of quite a few um, women who should have been perhaps more prominent in history than, than they have been. But Mary has, to an extent, had a moment in the sun, I think, in the last 20 years, with obviously you've had the other Berlin Girl book and films. Alison Wee, I don't know if you read it, has done a brilliant biography um, of Mary, which is just um, fantastic. And I think there's been some other works too. So I think there is an interest um, in Mary and, and the fact she seems to have taken such a different path to the rest of the Berlin um, clan. But of course, next to Mary at Hever, you've got the a portrait of Anne based on the Holbein sketch, which there is a degree of, and again, you all know farm about but there's a degree of controversy as to whether that sitter was Anne, isn't there? There is indeed, yeah. I'm a really odd individual in that I think most Anne fans um, either love or hate certain portraits of her or pu- that purport to be of her. Um, whereas I, I really don't have any that I don't like. Mm. Um, I think we can only really be certain, if I'm honest, about one likeness of her, which is, of course, the the most happy medal, mm. um, which we believe was created in 1534 and which is in, in terrible condition. Mm. Um, so it's very helpful in uh, determining her the shape of her face. Yes. Yeah. Um, but we don't have uh, a considerable mm. amount of facial detail to go by, mm. which is a, a great shame. Um, the version that sits opposite um, Mary, uh, based on the Holbein sketch, um, there's a question mark over it in that we cannot verify any uh, of the portraits being a good likeness mm. um but I, I i've seen the original one of the one of the question marks is over her eye color now in mm. our version she has a very dark eye color yes. which we know Anne had but in the sketch particularly in digitized copies that it looks blue right right, right. Um, actually actually having seen it in the flesh um that that tint of blue isn't there Okay, and, that's um, that's very interesting because most of us do is. only experience these things digitally. Exactly, and um, moreover, there are other examples where Holbein uses a very gentle shading yeah. uh, to define how how big uh, the iris is, essentially. And then when we look at his finished product, we have a much darker eye colour. Yeah. Um, so there is a, there is continuity there. It, it's not one of the reasons it, that make me doubt that it's her essentially okay um but actually there, there of course there's another uh, sketch by holbein which is attributed to Anne, mm. and they're often used as reasons to discredit the other one yes yes so yeah. there's that uh, the windsor we, collection that's yeah, right yeah. absolutely but actually i don't think they're irreconcilable images. i agree i agree i really don't and um this isn't an exact science at all uh, but I have, uh, of course, the, the sitters are facing or sitter are facing mm. in different ways. Also, their heads are at a different angle, mm. which make it difficult. Um, but I have flipped the images so they're facing this, the same way, enlarged so that proportionally the head is mm. uh, it, it, the same size. And what I find most striking is that the eye position, the nose position, the nose length, the mouth position, the mouth width are all very equal um mm. now this isn't mm. an exacting science because of course no, our right. facial features are different mm. uh, you know according to the, the, the side uh, they're not mirrored um but i i i think um one of the one of the big things that make particularly women look different in portraits mm. is their headdress yes um yes. now of course anne has this reputation of uh, of bringing the the uh, French hood over from the French court mm. that's um, uh, questionable uh, we do have examples of uh, women at the English court wearing them mm. before and I think she certainly popularized uh, yes, them yes. as queen uh, because we know Jane Seymour makes a concerted effort to move back to yes. the uh, more traditional English version I think that's a safer conclusion mm. um, but the gable hood does make a face look considerably different to a French mm. hood and that's why the fashions were so distinctive. Mm. Um, and it's funny, I, th- I think people 
sort of recoil from images of, of Anne when she's wearing a, an English gable hood, mm. for example, in the Nid Hill portrait. But again, I don't think any of these portraits contradict the descriptions yes, that we yeah. have of her. The oval face, the dark eyes, uh, the decided chin. Um, so I think in all honesty, we can't be certain about yes. any of them. But I think the most, um, uh, Ives does this sort of trilogy of um, mm. portraits, one uh, being one that was commissioned by Charles the First. Yes. Uh, the other being uh, the ring portrait that Elizabeth mm. had. And then, of course, we have the, the National Portrait Gallery slash Heaver Rose model, mm, mm. Uh, which when you compare all three, we do have all of those features uh, consistent. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I, I think that's probably the closest that we're likely to get yeah, I, yeah. Um, to, to, a, to an image of Anne. I do, I do agree with your point, though, that although it's not an exact science to compare the um, Windsor sketch with the other Holbein sketch, or, and of, although, of course, there needs to be caution, I agree with you that for, for so many people emphatically say it cannot be the same woman. Whoever it is in either, it <laughs> cannot. It, neither may be Anne, but both certainly can't be. I, don't, I agree with you. I don't think we can be that emphatic. People change. I mean, people, they do. In, in an era of photography, you can look completely different in one picture to another. You really um, can. And, and I, I think that particularly with the Win, Windsor sketch, um, so her attire is either a reason to definitely, that, that has to be Anne because she's in a nightdress and mm. just her coif and who else would uh, dare to dress like yes. that? Or it's used as a, well, no queen would ever dress like that. You know, it's yes. um, uh, both of those um, reasons are, are used to either accept or reject. Um, but again, we, we just have no idea of the context mm. of it. And um, there, there does appear to be um, more of a swelling around the throat in yeah. that um, picture. But she is looking down and, you know, the leanest of people can get a gathering of skin yes, when yes. they look down uh, as she is. And... I do have to question, you know, is this Anne in the later days of pregnancy? Yes. Is this her actually going into her confinement? Mm. And what better reason to uh, get a, a good likeness of, of your mm. queen than if she's going through the perilous journey of childbirth? Yes. Um, yes. So, you know, there are, there are many reasons that Anne could have been yes. in that kind of attire. And we also know that Henry loves to lavish nightgowns on Anne. Uh, she's mm, obviously a mm. fan of them. Um, so, yeah, I, I, again, wouldn't rule it out. Uh, and I like, uh, you know, going over all the details of it and, uh, you know, pondering if that is the face of Anne. Mm. And it is frustrating with kind. I mean, I think most Anne Boleyn fans would love to believe that the National Portrait Gallery Heaver Rose tradition, which is such, such a striking tradition, we'd love to believe that's the face of Anne. But of course, we're not really going to ever know, are we? No, uh, I think the one thing in favour of, of that particular pattern is that you can see a, a distinct likeness uh, with her daughter in them. But mm. of course, we have no evidence to suggest that any of them were created uh, other than during her reign. Yes. So yeah. the artist may well have simply drawn upon uh, Elizabeth's facial features mm. because mm. of a likeness uh, for their inspiration for those posthumous portraits. Mm. Because National Portrait Gallery and Heva Rose are clearly based on the same thing, aren't they, in one way or another? Yeah, very much so. Very much the same attire. Of course, we've got the, the famous bee pendant, the French mm. hood. Uh, but there are subtle differences. Mm. So, for example, in uh, the Heva pattern, we have hands, we have a rose, yes. uh, very much in the Horan boot style. Mm. Uh, and he is uh, one of the candidates that may well have painted the original. Uh, but unlike the National Portrait uh, Gallery version, of which there are a number, um, the, we, we aren't aware that any of the, the Heva Rose pattern um, have ever been dendrochronologized. Right. Uh, and that's something I very much hope in the near future to be able mm. to rectify with a, a project to do so. Oh, brilliant. Uh, because there are actually a series of portraits uh, in private collections that most of which we haven't been able to locate yet, which do adhere to this hand and rose pose pattern okay. they haven't been seen publicly since the 1950s so mm. i'd love to be able to properly trace them down mm. well, and start a, a database uh, where we can say well this is the earliest this is the the like the, the closest to Anne. 
Well, Alison Weir was telling me about the perils of trying to track down um, artwork in private collections and sort of talking about oh, gosh, yeah. turning up and people having shotguns and all, all sort of stuff. And I just always assumed, I guess because I'm a history lover, that if I had not that my family's ever going to have something like that in the attic. But if we ever had something like that, you'd want to share it with the world. But Alison yeah. was saying, no, no, it's not like that at all. People do not want people to know they have it. No, not at all. And particularly with Anne these are incredibly desirable paintings mm. and these paintings are typically handed down um you know uh, through through families uh, that doesn't always mean that those families are uh, incredibly wealthy and they may not actually be able to afford the insurance that right, uh, right, you know right. such a valuable commodity would require so, you know, that, I'm not saying that's the case with all of these paintings, far from mm, it. Mm. You know, a lot of them are in very wealthy yes. uh, hands. But, you know, these, these are, uh, items are often uh, in families that, that, you know, just don't want the world to, to know mm. about it, essentially. Mm. They want to keep it private. And uh, as private owners, I suppose that's their, uh, you know, right. I suppose so. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. So it's there's quite a, frustrating. There's, there's always two sides to the story, isn't there? There is, yeah. Um, Speaking of Anne, of course, the Hiva was um, residence to another famous Anne as well, Anne of Cleves. How, how on earth did Anne of Cleves end up um, resident at Hiva Castle? Uh, she's one of my favourites, I have to admit, and I'm delighted to say that she did indeed live at Hiva. Um, so um, after the, the tragic downfall of Anne and then George, mm. of course, um, Thomas is left without a male heir. Um, there's some ambiguity as to what happens here. We don't actually have a copy of Thomas's will. Right. Uh, but we do know that there is a reconciliation. Of course, he did have a falling out, particularly because of Anne with Mary, mm. uh, when mm. she chose to marry William Stafford uh, without the Queen's consent. Yes. We do know there's a reconciliation between Thomas and Mary towards the end of his life, uh, and that he does indeed leave her lands at Hever, but not Hever Castle itself. Right. That right. is left or is certainly acquired uh, by uh, James Boleyn, okay. Thomas's brother. Now, whether this is because Thomas has lost his male heir, yes. uh, yeah. or whether he simply wants to keep it in Boleyn hands rather than yes. Stafford hands, yes, yes, yes. Um, we, we, we just don't know, essentially. But we're not um, aware of any entail that puts it in the no. male line. No, no. And indeed, you know, uh, during his own lifetime, it was co-owned by Elizabeth Boleyn, his right, wife. Right. Uh, it had been left explicitly to Elizabeth uh, mm. by William, Thomas's father. Um, but what eventually ends up happening is that, that Thomas uh, leaves it to James, and then James sells it by indenture to Henry VIII uh, in 1540. And um, he does so also with the transference of some properties in Norfolk. This is the Boleyns retreating right. to their Norfolk base. Um, now, Hever comes into its own when uh, the marriage, of course, the very brief marriage uh, between Henry VIII and Anne of Cleves falls apart mm. very uh, rapidly. And she's left it, or rather she's allowed to rent it. It's a really clever little... Um, sort of clause that Henry puts in where he allows her to rent these properties, but he pays the rent. So essentially okay. they're staying in crown hands. They're, they're right. properties that she can then sell uh, on or leave to people. Is that Very the same company. of Richmond and all the other ones? He Absolutely. Gives yeah. Right. Richmond and Bletchingley. And of course, when Anne um, loses her status as the King's sister mm. and becomes the King's aunt, when Edward the sixth, uh, ascends to the throne, he actually revokes her rights to lease Richmond and Bletchley. Mm, mm, mm. uh, so and that is uh, uh, the time when uh, we believe that Anne spends most of her time at Hever. Right. We have a number of pieces of correspondence. I mentioned one earlier to her brother from uh, Hever. Mm -hmm. She also writes to Mary when she ascends to the throne from Hever. So she, we believe she spends quite a, a lot mm. of her time there. And I think she's fond of it as well because she leaves funds for the poor right. uh, when she dies at Chelsea, um, the, the poor of Hever. Um, so, yeah, it's, a, it's lovely to think of her there. Um, mm. And it's, you know, it's really nice to, to see one of the, the wives sort of thriving, really. Mm. Um, she's often portrayed as, you know, the outcast, Mm, mm. But actually, I can see a woman 
making the most of her lot mm, mm. and being very wily about it as well. She's um, constantly um, trying to acquire more money. This kind of leads to a reputation of her living in penury. She's not. Mm. She's got a really good income. That, of course, is affected by inflation during Edward's mm, reign. Mm. Um, but, um, yeah, she's yeah, most certainly the survivor out of all the wives, mm. I would argue. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's, it's fascinating. She's so often... Um, overlooked but or eclipsed perhaps by the other great Anne of that era but she it's good to see that she um and you do pick this up when you go to Hever that her history is remembered there and it's part of the story um of the castle yes in, in terms of um we've obviously just had a very odd year in terms of visits um and what tourism has been allowed I have to say we I think the first day that the castle or the first weekend the castle was open again we we headed um straight back and it was great all very well organized all very well managed as we head toward autumn and the winter what's coming up that people should come and see at Hever? So yeah um you're right it's been very trying um during this awful pandemic yeah. um, but we're so lucky that we were able to open the grounds and then the castle uh, and we have a you know, really great programme of events uh, left to come, not least Halloween, which is always wonderful for the family. And we're going to have a trail through the grounds and I'm sure the castle will be decorated uh, even more spookily than some people find it today. And, um, but the, my favourite event of uh, the calendar year is always Christmas at Hever. It's quite extraordinarily magical. Mm. Um, there's a wonderful themed trail through the grounds this year the theme is peter pan um, so it's going to be uh, incredibly Amazing. magical wow. um, but they uh, absolutely lavish the the grounds with different colored lights for each tree it looks uh, astonishing and the castle is always completely filled with christmas trees mm. the smell is intoxicating complemented i think perfectly by open log fires um, mm. which we're able to have in uh, a couple of the rooms um, it's yeah it's just an absolute treat uh, for the senses and uh, we have uh, the addition of some really lovely things like a, a traditional um, gallopers a, a, you know a, a carousel mm. and a sort of vintage uh, Victorian uh, amusement games like mm. coconut shards and stuff like that roasted chestnuts uh, it's just magical no you'll certainly see me there at christmas then fantastic yeah i'm i'm already itching to get the fires going now that the temperature <laughs> started to drop uh, it's one of imagine. my favorite one of my favorite pastimes i just think it really helps bring uh, the castle to life to have that mm. lovely smell that would have transcended the ages there always mm. would have been a hearth there always would have been a fireplace going at Hever mm. and uh, it just sort of imbues the the whole room it mixes with the scent of the beautiful woods that mm. Asta chose the the walnuts um and it just creates a magical ambiance it's mm. it's incredible and of course Hever is open for events as well isn't it people can have parties there and people can stay at Hever people I think often people don't realize how much you can actually do there oh my god yeah I mean you, you know um we're not holding private events as such at the moment, only uh, small and legal yes. weddings. Um, but of course, we have a, an incredible bed and breakfast. Now, this is the extension that Asta was able to put onto the castle. Mm. But rather than altering the castle uh, itself, it very cleverly created a bridge at the back uh, and then created a beautiful mock Tudor village, right. uh, which is actually an interconnected set of 100 rooms uh, where he would keep his guests mm. uh, where his family lived because believe it or not William Wardorf has to stayed in the castle on his own and, oh wow <laughs> um, yeah and also it has like a space <laughs> yes no quite um and and liked ghosts apparently because he was uh, very much very uh, much in favor of the occult mm. um but yes the, the, this uh, extension has now been transferred into a luxury bed and breakfast which is quite exceptional um, I smell the breakfast every morning as I'm arriving for work and I'm <laughs> heartily jealous um, of uh, those uh, partaking in it so yeah it's a, a absolutely magical place to stay you're literally staying where royalty and where prime ministers uh, mm. across the ages stayed as guests of the Astors so it's a really mm. unique experience 
well, I'm hoping um, in a couple of years' time to do something for my 40th at Hiva. But oh, wow. if, if this blooming pandemic has gone by then, but we, yes. <laughs> let's hope so. We shall see. Uh-huh. Well, Owen, we are drawing to the end of our time. But um, as we say goodbye, is there anything else you'd like to say about the castle or to people watching that you think they need to be aware of? Um, I just implore people to come. Um, you know, it's been, as uh, with all uh, areas of the heritage sector, quite devastating at times uh, because of uh, the pandemic but uh, Hever have put in incredibly sensible social distancing mm. measures um, and uh, as someone that's there every day I do mm. really feel safe um, and um, uh, still able to enjoy indeed there are many benefits actually uh, there are longer queues but you mm. really do feel like you have the castle yeah. to yourself we, we were in the uh, castle with just time. two other people when we were there yeah. and i've never spent you know I, I don't know if i spent longer in it but you just feeling you had that space and good look yes. at everything and not have to get out of a room and it was brilliant yeah no and uh, you know if you are able to come and support us or buy something off the online shop or something like that then it would be much appreciated i think um, i've got a heaver castle pen here actually actually i've got oh, two <laughs> yeah i do, lo- do love a bit of heaver stationery yeah that's always been my go-to thing for the shop during uh, when i was a kid yeah absolutely exactly. and still <laughs> well <I> could, <laughs> be careful you could spend a lot of money in that oh um, my goodness yes Owen, thank you so much for joining us. It's been brilliant to speak to you. And hopefully, um, as these books start to be published, we can um, speak to you again. Fantastic. Thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure. And uh, look forward to seeing you at Hebrew again soon.